Good evening, I'm Casey Nolan. Tonight in this season of giving, we are talking about just that, philanthropy in St. Louis. We like to say that we're generous in St. Louis, but are we really? Are our government officials making it harder to be generous? And how do you know your dollars are really making a difference? Stay tuned. Nationally, total philanthropic giving in 2011 was nearly $300 billion, and 73% of that was given by individuals. The same is true in St. Louis. You, the individual, gave 1.8 of the $2.5 billion donated in the last year in our region. Our community has also made strides during tough times. Despite the recession, charitable contributions have remained steady locally at about $4,250 per tax return. But the need is growing. On the surface, it might look like a grocery store, complete with shopping carts, onions, canned goods, and bananas. But it's not a grocery store. Instead, it's the Emergency Assistance Ministry, a food pantry in Florissant. And it's a place where a growing number of St. Louis area residents go for food. For many, food is simply a luxury they can't afford to buy. It's the one thing that you can choose to cut back on. Um, you know, when the, uh, uh, the utility bill comes, I mean, if you don't pay your, util your utility bill, eventually your lights go off. Um, you know, if you don't pay your rent bill, you find yourself out on the street. If you don't put gas into the car, you can't get to work, and then you lose your income. And, and so, you know, after those things occur, the one area that you can cut back on, of course, is going to be food. And the number cutting back is going up. When I first started working here, 12 families a day was considered a busy day. Now, 35 to 45 families is considered an average day. So we're really going through the food. It really hurts, you know, and when you have people coming in and practically living in their cars or living at the motels and stuff like that, it, it hurts. Sherry LaRose gets assistance from the pantry. I lost my job about 10 years ago. A lot of medical issues and needed help. Despite that help, she says times are still tough. You know, there's probably seven or eight days by the end of the month that, you know, you're really hurting. And at many pantries, inexpensive food is the best they can do. We don't purchase fresh foods. No, we, we can't. We'd like to give them more food. We'd like to be able to buy more food, but uh, in the perfect world, but it's just not perfect anymore. We just can't do it. It may not be perfect, but Sherry LaRose says it's enough to get her through the month. And for that, she's thankful. For Stay Tuned, this is Matt Noonan reporting. Before we talk specifically about St. Louis, let's back up just a little bit and get a national perspective. We're going to start our show off tonight on Google Plus talking to a man by the name of Patrick Rooney. Pa Patrick Rooney. Patrick is the executive director for the Center of Philanthropy at Indiana University, really a, a leading expert on this topic nationwide. He wouldn't brag on himself, so I will just a little bit. <laughs> Patrick, thank you for being here with us. I, I guess, first of all, what are some trends that you're seeing nationwide? It's no secret we've had some tough economic times lately. That's right, Casey. You know, one of the things that's interesting right now is as the economy recovers, we're seeing philanthropy recover. But just like the economy recovering at a fairly slow rate, we're seeing private philanthropic support also recovering at a slow rate. And this is important to keep in mind following you know, the perfect storm during the Great Recession in which we had all-time high demand because of unemployment, hunger, homelessness, and so on. At the same time, we also had diminished philanthropic support. Total giving declined 15% in inflation-adjusted dollars during the, during the Great Recession. So at the same and time, when people, when, so, so when people needed it the most, there was less to be handed out, so to speak. Is that, is that what exactly. you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. And, and not only did philanthropic support decline uh, through private giving, but also government contracts and grants to nonprofits declined, and income off of their endowments fell, and earned income fell. And so uh, nonprofits saw this coalescing of, of high demand and low supply of, of, of resources from all sources. 
And so that made it fairly difficult for all the constituencies who needed to be served to be served in a timely and, and accurate manner or complete manner. How, how fast are we recovering? Or is, is, is philanthropy recovering at the same sluggish rate as the economy or, or, or even worse? Yeah, it's, it's really tracking fairly closely with the economy. It's not exactly the same. Uh, in some ways, it's even worse. If you, uh, if you look at the average of the last two years of recovery, it, if the economy continued to grow at its current rate and the philanthropic recovery continued to grow at its current rate, it would take just over a decade to get back to where we were in 2007 before the Great Recession began. Ten years to get back to where we were. Exactly. Wow. Um, but who, who gives these days? Who, who gives? How much? Is it, 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 it? Can you break that down for us? Sure. I mean, one of the things that's you know really wonderful about America is that in any given year, about two thirds of Americans give something at all, and so this might be as little as you know twenty five dollars to uh, help out a local charity or to the local mass mosque synagogue, but. Uh, you know, many people are giving, you know, large dollar amounts as well, and there's a, a great variation. What we find on average is that in a typical year, the average American gives just over $2,000 uh, of those who donate uh, something at all. Uh, we've also done studies for Bank of America on philanthropy among high net worth households, and we see in this that high net worth households, which we categorize as those earning $200,000 a year or more and or having a million or more net and net worth excluding their primary residence, what we find is that those households give quite a bit. And that, that, that small top group of 3% account for just over half of total giving. But it's also important to acknowledge that the rest of America, the, you know, the lower 97%, so uh -huh. to speak, that they also account for almost half. Yeah. And so the charities need to pay attention to both major gift donors at the high end, but also uh, you and me and everybody else in between who are who constitute the rest of the giving population. Real quickly, I, I just, I, I, last question, is this uniquely American to some degree? Are, are we different than other countries when it comes to how we take care of our, our folks and, and, and causes and arts and different things? Well, Casey, it's, it's, it's not uniquely American in the sense that uh, we, what we see is if you look at philanthropy around the world, that there are some forms of philanthropy in every society sure. across every generation, sure. right? Um, but it's, it's uniquely American in the sense that we give a higher share of our GDP, we give a higher share of our personal income, we are more deeply engaged in philanthropic support for the nonprofit sector in many different dimensions. Part of this is a result of our tax policies. Uh, we also have the lowest uh, tax rates of any country except for Japan of the Western industrialized nations, and so there's a difference there. Yeah. But I think there's also been an American tradition of, of self-reliance and reliance on, on private philanthropy. Patrick Rooney, uh, Indiana University, thank you so much for starting our show off for us tonight. We appreciate your time. We also want to get uh, your voice into the show tonight as well. To tell you how to do that, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Ed Reggie. Ed? Thanks, Casey. Well, I want to tell the viewers at home that you are a part of tonight's conversation, a critical part. Whether you're at home or in our live studio, we want you to join in the conversation. What is missing? And we want to hear from you. Now, there's two ways you can join in. We want you to log in onto our Facebook wall, The Nine Network. We put a question up there earlier today, and people are already commenting on that. We want you to add your voice to that, too, as well. Or you could search for the hashtag StayTunedSTL on Twitter, and send us a tweet. Let us know what you're thinking, what is missing from the conversation. We want to hear from you. Okay, joining us now to, again, kind of set the stage for our show tonight, but now on a more St. Louis, on a local regional level, Mary McMurtry uh, with the Gateway Center for Giving. Um, so you, you, you kind of heard what we were just talking about on a national level there. I want to kind of get the pers your perspective locally. Uh, first, I'll, I'll put you on the spot to speak for all of St. Louis. Are we, uh, in, from your perspective, as generous as we like to think we are? You know, every time the Coleman race comes around or the Red Cross holds an emergency drive, we, we, we hear it on television all the mm -hmm. time that we're, we're very generous. Do you, do you, do you buy that? I do, I do buy that, and I think it's important for us to really celebrate in our community the really long history of generosity that we have and should be very proud of. I knew there was no way you would say no, by the way, but I, but I do believe you, and I appreciate that. Um, what, what trends are you seeing locally here can, that you can tell us about 
you know, in the last couple of years as we've been through the recession in St. Louis, is, is philanthropy changing in our town, in our region? It's a very important question, and I think it, it mirrors what Patrick was saying kind of on the national level. But something that's very interesting for the St. Louis level is if you look at the giving pie, so the percentages of, of where the philanthropic dollars come from, 75% of the giving comes from individuals. About 5% comes from private foundations, and about um, close to 13 to 15% comes from corporations. That's the, almost the opposite of what we see in other communities like ours nationally. So they have much less dependent on corporate giving, a greater uh, dependency and, and a greater asset base in those communities with, through private foundations. Mm -hmm. um, and so that changes, that changes the conversation for us in St. Louis really at the start regardless of what the recession does, that conversation was already changing and we've needed to keep current with that and be responsive to Okay, that. well expand on that. What do you, how, how do you mean? What, what should we be, what should our conversation be? So even before the recession began, we started to see the advent of corporate social responsibility for a lot of the corporations and they were really moving from a model of giving because they were founded in communities, because the heads of those uh, corporations lived in communities, to really thinking differently and more strategically about their charitable giving. And so that change was really coming for uh, well before the recession hit. Is that good or bad? Um, it, it's fine for them. It's, it's absolutely in line with what they can do as, as corporations. Sure. Um, but in it, in it, isn't, it doesn't have a net good or a net bad, but it means that we have to respond differently then to, it isn't enough to say, you know, I do good work, so therefore fund me. We have to figure out how can I help that corporation, how can I help that entity advance what they're trying to do in the marketplace. And that's a different conversation. Uh, what about our individuals? Are our individuals changing at all? Are, the, is the, are, the, are our younger givers, if you will, changing? What do you see changing mm -hmm. on the individual level? So I think on the individual level, it's very interesting. Um, and that's really in, in part where we see a lot of the generosity that we talk about. Um, and, and it really bears out nationally from uh, as a comparison that, um, that Americans give more as a percentage of their overall net income than you see often in um, the national figures. So we, we have a very rich tradition we call giving while living. Um, and, and we should be very proud of that. The challenge really is, is looking at, this is sort of one of the first times in our, in our history that many of us can sort of say we have so many different giving um, entities occupy, occupying the same space. So you've got the traditionalists, the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, and the millennials, and then whoever's sort of coming online now. And all of them are have different preferences and different styles and different wants and needs. Different ways they like to give. And different ways they like to give. Different places they like to give too. Absolutely. Right, so the traditionalists and the baby boomers and some of those um, were far more accustomed to showing up on Sunday morning and putting you know, their dollar in the basket and that was you know, a big part of their charitable giving and right. we see that right in, in looking at the lion's share of that 75% were to their um, religious entities. Young people coming online, millennials, are far less, they're sort of considered sector agnostic, meaning um, they look at charitable giving not just as this is a charity, a 501c3, but they think of it as an investment. So they're looking at social enterprise, they're looking at all kinds of other ways, social impact bonds, other, other mechanisms um, to do this sort of good and feel that they have those tools at their disposal. They can go online and tweet money through their phone. Text to the Red Cross at, during the hurricane. As, or you know, and build a well in the Congo, right? right? Um, and so that's a very, they're, they're plugged into a different kind of universe. They're also coming online, not identifying nearly as much as their, um, uh, the folks coming before them mm -hmm. as being religious. They're identifying as being spiritual, but not religious in those same way. And so that's gonna be an interesting challenge. And it just, again, it's not about less money, it's about that it's changing sort of how it shows up. I wanna ask you about how educated, how, is it important to be an educated giver? Mm, it's, it's is, is that possible to be an educated right. giver? It's, it's probably uh, you know, one of the best questions and in some ways one of the most difficult to answer. Um, and I think that a lot of people have different ideas about what it means to be an educated giver. And I think certainly we would talk to folks about um, you know, do your research, know your organization, know your mission, um, you know, Charity Navigator, GuideStar, there's some wonderful national resources. Um, here, our local United Way has um, quality standards that they use with their agencies, and we find those are really helpful tools, and, and, and the Better Business Bureau also has their standards that they look at. 
What we really recommend, what I really recommend to folks coming online is don't have those be the end of the conversation. Have those quality standards, have those percentages be the start of a conversation. What you want to know is not what's the percent of admin and overhead, oh, it's too high, I'm not going to give to you anymore. To be able to say, tell me why that is and why that's important because maybe your business model is different and you have children in a residential setting as opposed to children in an aftercare setting where the laws are different. And so what it's going to cost you to do those programs looks different. I set you up for, for the first question and I set you up for the last one. That's a perfect segue into our next Google Hangout. We thank you for your time, Mary, from the Gateway Center for Giving. Thanks for being here and for getting our conversation started. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, my pleasure. We appreciate it. Welcome back into the live studio audience. For the next part here, we're going to go back to Google Plus Hangout, and we're going to talk just what we alluded to there with Mary. We want to talk about being an educated giver, making your dollars count. Uh, joining us, this is Kirby, uh, Kirby Burkholder with IFF. He's joining us from Chicago. Thank you for your time tonight and bringing your expertise to the table. Also with us, uh, Michelle Corey. She's local here with the Better Business Bureau. They've developed some standards that we're going to talk about. And Amelia Bond with the Greater St. Louis Community Foundation. Uh, as the name says, she too is here joining us. So, folks, let me uh, let me open it, up, open it up to you all. Um, is it bad? Is it a bad idea to think of your charitable giving, your philanthropy, as an investment? We we heard a little bit of that in the conversation there with Mary about how that's pe that's how people are starting to think. Uh, if if you if I told you that's how I did my giving, what would you say to that? I'll, I'll open it up to all of you. I actually think it's a great approach. Um, yeah, so many so many individuals typically have looked at giving as kind of a one-time contribution. And one of the most important things we see in the nonprofit sector is this concept of long-term sustainability. And part of long-term sustain long sustainability is, is making an investment in an organization, getting initiatives off the ground, but then also looking to um, support them through the long term. And I think when you think about making an investment, you do the due diligence. And then you want to monitor things on an ongoing basis. So I think it's exactly the right uh, mindset to have when uh, individuals think about uh, starting to make contributions to nonprofit organizations. Yeah, and Kirby, I totally agree. I think uh, particularly donors today, as Mary indicated and, and if you've just said, is donors are really looking forward to be an investment and ex expecting the return on investment, particularly this next generation. Um, and we see that constantly at the Community Foundation, is uh, setting up grant agreements and asking the questions and asking us to ask the hard questions on, am I getting the return from, for my uh, gift? And, and I'll jump in. That's, that's a little bit of what all of you kind of do. You all have experience with um, multiple different organizations, and, and you know, I, Kirby, you, you guys funnel money towards different organizations, and, and uh, Amelia, the, the talk about the community fund, you guys are doing a lot of the legwork for people in a lot of ways. Right, right. The Community Foundation, we have about 400 funds, uh, have about 200 million in assets, and we represent uh, about half of our donors are actually living donors. Um, and the other half have left uh, their money to the St. Louis community and, and about 80% of those funds stay in the St. Louis community. The remainder go um, elsewhere in the country and around the world. And uh, yes, we, we are really there to help our donors and represent the donors and make sure that their money is going uh, to at being spent <coughs> as wisely as possible and meeting the needs of the community. Michelle, if you don't have a fund, if you just want to make an individual contribution, I, I know you guys have some standards that you set and, and, and that people can kind of reference. Uh, what do you look for to know a, a charity is, is worthwhile? Well, for more than 100 years, the Better Business Bureau has been encouraging individuals to give, but give wisely. And one way to do this is by going to the Better Business Bureau and uh, getting a charity report to find out does a, that charity you're considering doing a business with, making a contribution, do they meet our 20 standards for charity accountability? We have evaluated over 800 uh, local charities and 
200 of those have now met all 20 standards for charity accountability. And these standards look at such things as governance and oversight, effectiveness, uh, finances, how do they spend the money they receive, uh, how much is going to fundraising, how much is actually going to support programs and services. So we evaluate those charities, we encourage people to check out those reports and give, but give wisely. And I'll, I'll put it out to all of three of you. You touched on it there and Mary touched on it at the table. Is there a magic number that you want to look at and say, oh, they, they're spending this percentage on the actual cause and this percentage on staff and lights and electricity or whatever? It, do, how do you feel about that? And, and, and is that something that you can walk people through? Well, I, I'll you t tell you what the Better Business Bureau standards state. And, and on the, um, is it 65 percent um, should go to support expenses of, of programs and no more than 35 uh, percent should go uh, for related contributions. And I would just add, I think Mary McMurtry from Gateway Center for Giving did an excellent job of articulating this. I think it, those that is really the start of a conversation. I think those measures as established by the Better Business Bureau or a Guide Star or Charity Navigator are critical because it really helps people start to think about uh, the administration and resources that are required to run a nonprofit. But I think it's, it's important then to do that further due diligence and get a sense of organizations that have higher fixed costs and then also looking at organizations in terms of the long-term delivery methods. So I think it, Mary said it exactly right. I think using benchmarks like the Better Business Bureau and then starting a conversation with organizations to, to, to have them talk about how they um, are good stewards of resources or not. And, and I think uh, the transparency is a really important consideration. We're a 501c3 ourselves. We have our audits up on our website. We sought um, um, certification by the, the organization that, that does the credentialing for our sector and I think the concept of transparency and being open to that dialogue is a really important initial factor when considering organization. Yeah, and I, I just like to say I think uh, you know the landscape is so large. I mean, there are thirteen thousand nonprofits in the St. Louis metro area, and you know we have. Uh, oh, say that again. Thirteen thousand. Thirteen thousand. In the St. Louis region. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, only in the about 864, I think I'm uh, in the right range, 864 have budgets annually over $100,000. So the landscape is huge and it's just in, really important for donors to, to do this diligence. And uh, that's you know why the community foundations exist. We give over uh, 2,000 grants currently per year, Better Business Bureau, and that's why this is such a key issue is, uh, you know, it's, it's a vast, vast community. It strikes me that you guys are kind of the watchdogs, uh, you know, holding uh, nonprofits accountable. Is that a, is that an appropriate way to look at this? And if so, is it working? Are they are you pleased with what you see generally? Well, uh, absolutely, because there's a lot of great uh, organizations out there in our community that deserve support. There's also some organizations out there that don't deserve the support, and it's really uh, up to donors to separate the good from the bad and and to give to make your community stronger. And I think we also are seeing a lot of mergers of of nonprofits, and I think all the um, the various organizations that are involved with donors, and you know, like the Better Business Bureau, uh, Gateway Center for Giving, the Community Foundation. You know, there's so many. Uh, you know, we we are hopefully bringing capital markets and uh, efficiency into the marketplace, so that we do encourage mergers of organizations that are small. Thank you all for your time and for joining us uh, and for your perspective and for, and for the work you do for all of us. So uh, we thank you for being here thank tonight. You. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't sure when to start walking, I'm sorry. <laughs> Amy Dunzander, John Paul, and Sarah Thompson are joining us here tonight uh, on the show. We appreciate you guys being here. Um, should I put you on the spot now and ask you if you've all made your charitable uh, contributions before the end of the year? Or do you How want much me to come? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, <laughs> at, at a dollar amount. In fact, if, you, if you'd like, just put it right here. I'll make sure it goes where it needs to. In your to. name, right? If, if you'd like, just leave it, make, it, make it out to cash. It's my middle name. Um, well, uh, let's just open it up, uh, kind of open-ended here so far. Uh, what, have you, what have you heard so far tonight that um, 
piques your interest or maybe anything surprise you so far? We've heard a lot about the trends nationally, locally. What, what are you thinking? I just, that number, I mean, I feel like I, I work with a lot of nonprofits on, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of as clients. Um, 13,000? 13,000. 13,000 13, plus no 13, in our region 000. alone. Yeah, yeah because you think about sort of the traditional ones and 13,000. And then when she said the budget, I think she said 864 um, only have budgets over $100,000. That's, it blows my mind because, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot. We were talking about that, yeah. And, and they're increasing from what I've heard, heard, you know, getting ready for the show this week. They're, they're popping up more all the time. It's a lot to keep track of. I'm sorry, go what ahead. What Mary said about 75% of the giving in St. Louis is from individuals. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. That's a lot of opportunity. And I think those givers, especially when we're talking about young givers, are giving getting more savvy about where they give. We heard a little bit about meeting quality standards, about measuring impact. I think they're, they're more savvy about that local impact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And maybe more agnostic about about geography. I'm, I'm really interested in the conversation about are they giving locally or is the internet make it so much easier to you know build the well mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, her term as far as like sector agnostic was fascinating. And the other term I think she used was investment. Mm -hmm. and I totally agree with that. I, I see it. I mean, she said it. I'm like, that resonated with me. Yes, that I totally think of giving as investment, not necessarily for my returns, but for returns of the world. Like, mm -hmm. I want to give this something I know is going to provide a return to the betterment of a neighborhood, a people group, or whatever it's going to be, that it's going to do something. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say, I would add to the, the term that at least I would think is, is kind of characteristic of our Gen Xers, um, is I wouldn't say cynical, but uh, Skeptical. Yeah, I was going to say that. But you know, I didn't want to put so words the onus in your mouth. is on the nonprofits to tell their story, right, and Completely. to prove that they're making the impact that these savvy people, these skeptical people, expect. I mean, as we were talking before, I mean, they, they don't communicate very well. See, and that's where I actually disagree with you. And maybe it's just because I'm looking at it from a different side. I think there's a lot of organizations in town who they'll send out and they'll say, for every dollar you're donating, 92 cents is going to feed this, this, and this. But you're or a PR say, of yeah, Right. Products. No, and so maybe, and that's what I'm saying, looking at it from another side. I mean, but interestingly, as it relates to Gen Xers, is that I kind of feel sometimes actually overwhelmed about giving. I'm like, I feel like you get asked so much and I feel I'm at a stage as a young professional where I'm trying to build my own. I'm trying to buy a house. I'm trying to get this. I'm trying to get that. And it's like you are asked all the time. And so I think I have this kind of guilt of where do you give? You know, how many places do you give and how much, you know? So I would push back a little bit in the sense that, okay, I, when I look at envelopes, I go, trash. Right. But why aren't they actually telling their story in a better and more interesting way, uh, a way that's compelling. I think people, especially Gen Xers or anybody really, want, they want to be compelled. So when I look at that, I go, I go, I want to give my money. Like, wouldn't you rather have, in any company, any nonprofit should be operating that way. But I don't see nonprofits doing that. So I'm sitting at my desk the other day and I get an email that says, we're giving all of our students books for the holidays from a local school. Click on this link, go to Amazon, it'll get sent right to the, right to the teacher. I clicked on the link, went to Amazon, sent a couple books. So it books, was easy. Tweeted yes. about it. I believe in books. I believe in the organization. <laughs> it was really easy for me in five minutes. Literacy is good. And that's how I gave. Yeah. I believe in staying on time for the show. So thank you very much. <laughs> this is good. I like where you're going with. We've got a lot of questions to answer here tonight as we continue. One, one other factor, though, in all of this is not just the individual, even though we talked about the numbers there, but also public policy plays a large role in nonprofit, in the, in the lives of nonprofits and philanthropy in general. You may not always notice them, but they're there. All around the St. Louis region, signs of generosity. Some are happy signs. And I like seeing the joy in my children's face as well as in the other people that we pass by. Once you have that experience, I think you, it touches your heart. I think we gain a lot more by being a free zoo um, than we would if we were, you know, one of, you know, hundreds of zoos around the country that charge. Some signs are life preservers for people in the community. We have a wonderful volunteer base. We have a, a great number of people that, uh, that support us financially. Uh, most of the, uh, the local stores, uh, uh, you know, now donate their product to us. What used to be a busy day here is now a normal day. The food bank in 07 was providing about 45,000 meals a week. Right now that number is closer to 70,000 meals a week. For many charitable organizations in the St. Louis area, those numbers don't just document an increase in need, but a remarkable resolve among St. Louis area residents to meet it. If there's a human need, there's something about this community that says, I'm responsible to help meet that. I have an opportunity to make a difference. And people not only feel a responsibility, 
but there's a real satisfaction in making a difference in someone else's life. Those people that have the wherewithal to help out are doing a little bit more. And again, I think that just reflects how great St. Louis is in terms of its generosity. And the numbers show that the people of the St. Louis region are very generous. This year, the United Way of Greater St. Louis raised more than $72 million. That puts the St. Louis chapter fifth nationally in money raised, even though the St. Louis metro area is only the 18th largest in the U.S. I, I have been so impressed and so inspired by so many people in this community who say, I've seen the need, I see it all around me, and even though my times are tough also, you know what, I'm going to step up and give more because it's needed. And they cut out something else in their life so that they can help others. That really is inspiring to see in this community. But turmoil at the state and national levels could mean big changes. Professionals in philanthropy believe the imminent fiscal cliff could lead to reductions in tax credits for charitable organizations. Tax credits are probably going to fade away. And we're trying to figure out how do we compensate for that. Food pantry tax credits have expired. Uh, tax credits for uh, pregnancy services are about to expire. Um, those are great concern to us when we rely on those. Reduced tax credits could force many charitable organizations to tighten their belts, but that's not their only concern. Many believe tax deductions for donors could be greatly reduced as well. It's rare that we ever take a political stance. However, this is one where our board has stepped up and our board has voted and said, we oppose any change to the charitable tax deduction. People don't give for charitable deductions. We understand that for tax deductions. They don't give because of that, but it does help their capacity to give. So if I can get a deduction for my gift, it enables me to give more. And so at a time when need is higher, when it's more challenging to give, to do anything that would decrease giving, we think is a mistake. And while we're normally very apolitical, this is one where our board has taken a vote and said, we support charitable tax deductions, we support no change in those. Philanthropy may be headed into the perfect storm. The need is up, giving is slow to rebound from the recession, and decisions by Congress in the White House could make matters worse. For Stay Tuned, this is Matt Noonan reporting. Well, let's keep going with this idea of how public policy influences philanthropy. We are joined back on Google Plus again now is where we're headed. We're joined by two folks who are kind enough to make time for us uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, Caitlin Fleming with Social Finance Incorporated. I'll give you a little plug, a St. Louis native uh, where your, your mother uh, says you should call more. And Tim Delaney from the National Council of Nonprofits, uh, both from D.C. So let's let's dive right in. I think there's, we've got a lot to talk about here. You know, unless you are um, just flying back from another planet, you know, there's something called the fiscal cliff looming, uh, sequestration, cuts, taxes, changing, all kinds of things on the table. What are you guys looking at when you when you watch the news as it pertains to nonprofits what are you worried about well here in washington dc we're looking at the fiscal cliff as two major threats to america's nonprofits um, more importantly the work that they do in local communities the first threat is uh, there is scheduled right now in law an eight percent across the board cut of all domestic programs, or virtually all domestic programs. If a deal isn't reached, as we've been hearing about, th those cuts go well, well, yes, exactly. The, it's existing law, and so if, if Congress does not step in before January 2nd, they will then cut all these programs. Uh, as a consequence, um, we're looking at cuts to uh, Head Start for children, Meals on Wheels for Elders, we're looking at food safety issues, transportation safety issues, disaster um, funding, all sorts of problems that are going to get cut. Now that's the first problem because it shifts all sorts of additional burdens onto the backs of nonprofits. We already don't have enough resources to do the work that needs to be done. That then leads to the second problem and, and the great threat that we're facing. And that's that this Congress is looking at capping charitable contributions, capping the, uh, the charitable giving incentive so that your donations to your churches, to your synagogues, to your local food bank, your Girl Scouts, your United Way, all that then will get capped. And so people will really be hurting because nonprofits are being asked to do so much more with so much less. Uh, and it can't be done, it can't be sustained at this level. Caitlin, and, and, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. 
Positive. Tim's right. I mean, the the proposed cap on deductions, the recent national economic study indicated that even just a fifty thousand dollar cap could reduce charitable giving by one hundred and fifty billion dollars over ten years. Wow. And this reduction in philanthropy and cuts to domestic spending. I mean, it's a real problem on on the ground. That's you know fewer homeless people that can find stable housing and fewer children that can get educated and. As a lot of your guests have been talking about throughout the show, um, it, it's time to start thinking about investments in social programs. And it's not just the right kind of investment, it's a smart investment. And research shows that for every $1 invested in an early childhood education program, for example, um, we see $7 in avoided costs and benefits um, from those programs. But when budgets get tight, these are the types of programs that get cut and nonprofits don't have the resources to pick up the slack. So should the government take over these things in, in the first place? Where you know, we, that's, that's kind of the backdrop a lot of these conversations are taking place against is with the role of government. Should nonprofits be doing more or, 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 or should the government be filling these gaps and, and should we do it through the, through the government? Well, one of the things that uh, we think about in our work and, and we hear from governments and nonprofits and philanthropy from across the country is this fiscal cliff, for example, is just a symptom of a larger systemic reality um, of, of fiscal challenge that we're facing. And it's time for um, all of us to get serious and kind of take the long view on how we can work together creatively um, and develop new financial structures like we work with those parties to do on social impact bonds that give nonprofits the full resources that they need to achieve the outcomes that our communities need, um, that governments make the most impact out of the limited resources that they have, and that philanthropy and even new funding sources um, can make catalytic investments um, with their limited funding. And, and Casey, I, I, I feel the need to add in there, uh, Caitlin's absolutely right, by the way, uh, I would simply add that the research shows that government has been turning to nonprofits to do more work uh, in terms of delivering of services for the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, most people have not been paying attention to this. And so government is turning to nonprofits saying, you're more efficient, you're more effective. And so then they're turning the work over onto us, uh, asking nonprofits to then do all that work. At the same time, they're taking away the resources to do it. We're looking at uh, state governments that are slashing their, their programs and then turning to nonprofits saying, you need to take these over. We're not going to give you any funding for it. We're just going to uh, leave it alone and allow you, because you're mission driven, to step forward to fill the void. And I know locally, we, we, we serve Illinois in our viewing area here, here too at Channel 9. I know in Illinois, we've had instances where they've done the work and they're not getting paid from state agencies. Uh, absolutely. In fact, we did some work with the Urban Institute a couple of years ago, uh, and this project is continuing. And uh, your viewers in Illinois will probably want to know that the Donors Forum of Illinois is working on this problem. And the Urban Institute has documented, and I'm reading here, that uh, the state of Illinois is the worst in the nation on late payments to nonprofits. It's the third worst for not paying nonprofits the full cost. Not only do they not pay us any profits, they don't pay us enough to actually do the minimal amount of work in the first place. Okay, so as we, then, as we run out of time here, just briefly, what would, if, if I gave each of you a magic wand, what would you like to see our lawmakers do that would help in, in, as it, it pertains to philanthropy in the U.S.? Well, I, what I would urge is that all of your viewers contact their representatives and their senators in the U.S. Congress and let them know that these cuts cannot continue on domestic programs. Say no on the cuts, and most definitely say no on all the proposed caps on charitable contributions. And in addition to addressing the immediate crisis of the, the fiscal cliff, I'd love to see um, governments start to shift their policy making and, and financing of social programs more towards outcomes rather than outputs that um, gives nonprofits the full resources that they need to, to achieve the outcomes our societies need. Caitlin Fleming and Tim Delaney, thank you both for your time, for coming to us from DC tonight. We appreciate your time and, and your insights. It's, uh, it's invaluable. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just so you don't think we're playing TV magic on you, we're now going to toss it back over to Ed and the gang, who you will see another very handsome man with a beard and glasses. Slightly more handsome, some would say. Uh, and they're going to fill us in on, on what you're saying. Ed, what's going on uh, when it comes to social media so far in the show? Well, they're saying 
a lot, actually. Uh, one of the things that I'm just going to gravitate right to is uh, there's a conversation about the size of organizations. Actually, uh, I believe one of our live audience members, Abby Steingruby, I hope I'm getting her name right, she really said, you know, are people more inclined to give to smaller organizations than these large, more massive organizations? What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there might be some truth to that if you're familiar with an organization or you see their work locally in the community. I mean, I think a lot of it, that's how people get involved in certain organizations. So I think that, I think that you know, is there. But there's also the skepticism if something's too small and it's like, hey, John, I started a nonprofit last week. You know, you want to make a donation. I mean, which happens. I mean, I know plenty of people who start, yeah. um, you know, they're artists in town or this or that and they start or a nonprofit and, you know, they want money for startup and and that know. brings up the point I mean if they're smaller I mean not much talk about impact you know mm -hmm. what could the smaller not to say that smaller organizations don't make don't have impact we know they do but there's not a lot of conversation what do you what do you think about that I mean there's not a lot of talk about the impact that the organizations do I tend to give to organizations that I know mm -hmm. and it's often easier to know smaller organizations. So that gives me the ability to see that they're making an impact. So it's all about that personal experience. That might be here locally, or it might be my friend who's building soccer fields in the Middle East, who I just gave a couple of dollars to. So, I mean, it doesn't, again, we bring in the geography question, but I think when you're, when you're closer to it, when you are on the board, when your friend works there, when you go to their events, um, you can see the impact and it gives you that connection to give. And in my experience, those are often smaller organizations. Yeah, or I, easier to touch. Right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, to me, that this I am, I am skeptical of larger uh, institutions. Um, the the only thing I would say to them would be, you know, how do you connect uh, people to your organization in a way that's meaningful? Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like a lot of them don't connect mm -hmm. uh, uh, people to their organization, other than maybe using them for volunteers or other things mm -hmm. like that. There doesn't. There isn't that sense of of I, there's that what was that the meaning for it? What was that term you used? Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but. Um, you felt I like, already. yeah. <laughs> well, so for me, like, and, and I am connected to uh, uh, some small organizations, and I feel like that's I, I have I have something to give to. I understand this organization. I know their numbers, uh, and to me, that that's a little more impactful. I, you know what I also think is interesting with larger organizations? I think people feel that other people will keep them propped up. And I think yeah. there is yeah. that feeling that it's like, well, hey, if I don't donate to this big national organization, there's millions of other people that right. will. And that's not necessarily the case. Obviously, they're strong because they do have a combination of strong individuals, corporate, and all of that. But yeah, I think when you have either people, I've noticed that people either get involved with organizations because it's personal. Mm -hmm. Someone passed away from such and such, and it's something they're connected to. It's something they believe in. It's a cause they right. want to. Or they know someone. And yeah, it really helps if you're volunteer already volunteering and, and, and that's with that organization. a great example of someone also I, I think is in the live studio Haley Luke I mean she kind of pointed that out mm -hmm. that having a close personal relationship to for some you know to that nonprofit it's gonna make it a lot more there's gonna be something there a connection no, well they've got you for life then right I mean if you're if you're early in at one of those small organizations and you're going to the trivia night because you're afraid if you don't go no one else will be there mm -hmm. um, you've invested and you'll be with them. Smart nonprofits will right. notice that you know time or a little bit of money now is a donor for, for life. Well, yeah. there's a lot of conversation, and we're gonna like actually cut right now too and see what else they're talking on the uh, Twitter sphere. <laughs> Okay, back into the studio here. We're gonna go back to Google Plus, take you back uh, for our next Hangout, which we're gonna talk about the future of nonprofit, uh, excuse me, the, the future of philanthropy. Uh, we have a few folks with us. Let me start off by introducing who we have here. You're seeing Starsky Wilson uh, with the Deaconess Foundation here in St. Louis. Thank you for being here. Amanda Cook. That's uh, me. Uh, thank you, Starsky. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, Amanda does some writing, some, uh, some PR, but we, we have her here tonight because uh, we're getting the uh, scoop on a piece you just did for the Business Journal. Uh, you've, right. done, you've been doing some research and you just turned it in uh, recently, I believe. So that's, that, that, is, that is off your plate, so you're free to hang out all <laughs> night now. Um, and also with us uh, is Brian uh, Nibrugi with the Archdiocese, Archdiocese of St. Louis. Brian, thank Hello. you for bringing your perspective with, uh, here tonight. And coming to us once thank again you. from Washington, D.C., Christina Costa, the Center for American Progress, a uh, nonpartisan 
progressive think tank. Is that a, is that a succinct, fair way of uh, framing uh, CAP? That's what we call ourselves, yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> hey, I have the internet. I looked it up. What do you want? Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about this. We've, we've, we just saw a tweet on the screen. We just we heard from our folks at the table earlier. We're, we're, we heard from our first uh, two guests. Things are changing. Uh, people are changing. The way they give, the way they, we, we heard the word agnostic uh, in terms of the organizations they may give to. Let me open up the screen, if you will, here. Um, how do you see the future of philanthropy? And I'll open that up to all of you. The, things are changing. What do you think? Well, I think in some ways things are changing, and I think it's the environment that we're in that's changing, but at the same time, I think people at their core, they're not changing. Still, they're going to want to give to the people they have the strongest relationship with. They're going to want to give to the people they see the most impact with. What's changing is how nonprofits are, are going to have to communicate that uh, to people and how the young people are going to be learning about that uh, charitable giving as well. We heard we heard the, the the word story. Tell me your story is what people were saying. Amanda, what what did you find in, in the research you've been doing? One of the trends that I saw was that um, people are both giving in their community because they feel connected to their community, but they're also giving outside due to you know the younger generation's comfort with the internet, as well as some of these big natural disasters that are happening. Um, people are responding and sending their money farther and farther away, or one of the things I heard. Yeah, I think one of the things you'll find, is, is, in as much as we talk about uh, younger generations and giving, is uh, the shift from what we could talk about as combined or federated campaigning that you see in the United Way or the combined federal campaign for government workers to crowdfunding. Um, so uh, young people, social entrepreneurs, uh, and socially aligned mission for profits, LC3s and the like, um, will actually crowdfund. So you'll see people going directly to the internet, uh, reaching out to people through uh, social media and allowing giving uh, through, fun through funding sources that are direct, um, that allow mass organizations, uh, uh, mass uh, uh, audiences to give to them directly, um, but don't have to go through intermediaries in the same way that much of our traditional philanthropy has gone. And there's some new funding tools as well, and yeah. I know that Christina can speak to this a little bit better than I can. Um, this is kind of her area of expertise, but I've heard of things called NAP tax credits, Neighborhood Assistance Program tax credits, and then um, social impact bonds, which is really where Christina's knowledgeable. Christina, I think you were just called out. Can you tell us about <laughs> so what is this social impact bond? It sounds impressive. Can you make sense of it for us? And, and, and it, this is an example of what you're talking about. How not just the givers are changing, but the vehicles are changing too, through which they may give. Right, I think that's, that's certainly very true. And social impact bonds are an outcomes-based financing tool for social programs. Uh, what's important to know up front is that they aren't a bond in any sort of financial sense. So just ignore the word entirely. It's a terrible name, but we respect it now. <laughs> Um, Who should we call? Idea, anyone we can call about that? I'm happy to do that. <laughs> okay. um, the basic idea of a social impact bond is that a government agency are, or agencies defines a specific outcome they want achieved um, relative to a population and promises to, achieve, to pay an amount of money if and only if that outcome is achieved. Um, obviously, this kind of puts the nonprofit providers who would provide those social services uh, to achieve the outcome in a bind. They turn to investors to put up working capital to fund those interventions. Um, if they're successful, the government releases payment. The investors receive what we call a double bottom line return. They get a very modest financial return on their investment, but they also get a very positive social return. Uh, which is something I think everyone is seeing, is that more and more people are interested in achieving a measurable, realized social impact um, through their giving. Talking now, about if oh, I'm sorry. They, sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, if they don't achieve the outcome in the original model, um, the government doesn't release payment and the investors don't get repaid. Is outcomes, uh, Starsky, Brian, is this something you guys are seeing? We've, we've heard that at our table tonight, we've heard it on Twitter. Uh, and other interviews, is, is outcomes something that people are wanting to see? They want, they want results, if you will? Absolutely, and outcome measurement isn't necessarily new. I mean, it's 
been part of the conversation uh, for the last at least 10 to 15 years. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, the narrow sources of funds or, or the uh, funds that have dried up, the fact that we see less funds available, uh, particularly on the public um, in public funding, uh, causes us to uh, seek outcomes with a more dogged focus, uh, more aggressively. So you see these new uh, methods and approaches. So, so while funders have been talking about outcomes for some time, uh, program evaluation and development for evaluation has been a part of the conversation and industry for the last 10 to 15 years significantly. Now you're finding that being directly tied to outcomes and even held out as a carrot um, to use uh, probably a, uh, one way of talking about social yeah. impact lines as well. Uh, Brian, let's talk about that double bottom line that Christina was talking about, not just the return, but also the, the, the fact that you know that you're, you're getting something out of it. Is, from your perspective, representing the Archdiocese of St. Louis, is there more to this than just dollars and cents in terms of what the, the benefits, if you will, of giving? Well, a absolutely. You know, I, I think that people, when they're when they are giving, when they're making a gift, they want to see that there is going to be it's going to touch the lives of people that that need the help. First of all, they want to be able to um, see see young people, for instance, getting getting a benefit, getting an education, or learning about their about how those young people are going to give. But I also think that people. Uh, understand that the, the gifts that we have are gifts that are given to us and we have to use them for the greater good to yeah. help others yeah. to help our friends and family and, and people in need i'll cut you off there because we're running short on time the night has flown by thank you all for your time we appreciate you sticking with us thank you so much thanks, thanks. thanks. Dr. Nancy Kinney is here with us for the few minutes we have remaining to help us make sense of everything we've been talking. I hope you've been paying attention because I'm not sure I could take it all in. But uh, we're from University of Missouri St. Louis, I should say. Um, I, I'll just open it to you real quickly. What what stands out? Things are changing. Tools are changing. A lot is changing. The, we've heard the perfect storm mentioned more than once when it terms of in terms of the, the negative impact of our economy and other things. Uh, what 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 piqued your interest so far tonight? Well, you're right. It's been a huge topic for us to try to tackle in this one hour period. And maybe it's because I'm a person who studies these things all the time. I'm thinking this is a lot of ground to cover. Uh, it's complicated. And part of the reason it's complicated is because this is so embedded in our society. Mm -hmm. This is so much about what we are as Americans, that we want to do things. And we want to do them in a creative and entrepreneurial sort of way. And uh, while giving is something which is very much part and parcel of what Americans see and value very much, uh, we like to try new things. We like to diversify and take some new approaches. So that was one of the things I was really picking up on, is that uh, all these terms thrown around, social impact bonds and donor advised funds. Very and, dynamic uh, landscape. Very dynamic. Are you worried um, about the fiscal cliff? Are you worried about uh, the changes that could be coming? Or, or, or? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm more concerned about the cuts to federal spending than I am uh, any possibility that the charitable deduction will be uh, more of a burden on the nonprofit. That's right. I think I think that's a that whole idea is if I could predict what would happen, that would be a non-starter. I just don't think that uh, legislators are going to allow uh, things like charitable uh, donations to not be tax deductible. I think that's uh, it, that's too risky a, an area for uh, policymakers to get involved in because. Nonprofits mobilize people, get them excited and mobilized and energized about issues. So I'd be surprised if that was actually uh, something which would happen. But cuts across the board to uh, organizations. I, I did some research as well, as everyone else has had some great information tonight. But that about 33,000 uh, human service organizations across the country have uh, contracts with the with the government. These are and nonprofits. These are nonprofits that benefit from philanthropy, depend on philanthropy, but for, they also but do for a work. large percentage they, they rely upon government funding for the work they do. In fact, over half uh, the nonprofit sector, especially in the social service area, is highly reliant on government funding for what they do. 
And while they work very hard to uh, get the funds from private individuals, we saw that they're a big component of charitable giving, uh, they rely on government funding. And if that is slashed, if that's cut dramatically, then uh, uh, this would be very, very difficult. As you can see, it's not something for the faint of heart to try to raise money for uh, charitable causes. At a time when the need is, is going up as well. That's great. So, okay, great. I offered a magic wand to a couple of our other guests. I'd like to offer you one as well now, too. What would you like to see happen? Uh, well, I think, I think some of the, the uh, suggestions are really good ones. I think nonprofits need to find new and different ways to tell their stories more effectively. Um, I think there's been a lot of uh, strides taken as far as what can be done to uh, make sure that when people give their their donation to a nonprofit, it's being used wisely. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, people give for a lot of reasons, and they give for emotional reasons. They give because they really care about trying to make a difference. Uh, they may not give to the most efficient organization, but they feel confident that it'll make some difference for an individual. So not to get too fixated on some of those kinds of uh, issues. But. Thank you for your perspective. Thank you for your time. The one thing we can't give tonight is more time to this topic, unfortunately. It's a big no, one. I'll take the blame for that one, uh, for, for not mapping it out as well as I should have. But thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Nancy Kinney from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. So for now, we will say good night and stay tuned. We have the power to expand our minds, enrich our lives, and provide endless entertainment. But the value goes far beyond our experiences with the arts. Next week on Stay Tuned, we explore how the arts in St. Louis are affecting our local economy in a big way. What are the issues that are important to you and to the St. Louis region? Share your insights. We want your ideas for a future episode of Stay Tuned. Call 314-512-9009 or email us at staytuned at ketc.org. Would you like to be a live audience member on Stay Tuned? Email us at audience at ketc.org. And you can always connect with Stay Tuned on Facebook and Twitter.